All right, people, uh, this is your boy Bryce, Brothers on Tennis. Uh, still here at the Frank Simmons annual doubles blowout um, here in at Harvard Park in Los Angeles, California. When you're on the grounds, you run into some people, right? And you meet people that have backgrounds that you may not know anything about. And we have with us today, Mr. Maurice Hunter. And we started talking a few minutes ago and he started taking me down the road. I said, you know what? Nope, let's put this on tape because other people need to hear this. Maurice, welcome to Brothers on Tennis. Thank you, Bryce. Give us a little bit about your background. Okay, I started playing tennis in Detroit, Michigan as an 11 year old. Wound up um, becoming a top player in the state, in the region, and of course then nationally. In fact, I think in the nationals, I beat two players that we can recall, a guy named by, by the name of Larry Safanke, mm -hmm. and a guy by the name of Charles Strode, if I'm not mistaken. And one other player, and I uh, wound up losing to Billy Martin in about the um, round of 32, round of 16 that year. Uh, first year playing the Nationals then. From then on, I became the number one player in men's tennis in the Midwest and dominated all the traditional tournaments. Kept me off the tour for a lot because um, they, those were prize money tournaments. And back in the day, before the ATP took a real hold, they didn't know who was going to control tennis. Right. Okay. And basically it was the ITF, the International Tennis Federation, and it was the United States Tennis Association. Mm -hmm. There was no world open tennis rankings. So at that time it was more about traditional championships. And all the ones that I watched growing up as a boy, the pros would come in town to win. My heart, I wouldn't say anything, was to win them all. And I did. All of them were big prize money tournaments. I won each and every one of them. In fact, um, one of the kids that I um, watched the last time I played one was a guy by the name of Aaron Crickstein that people are familiar with. I used to train him somewhat. Well, he and I were going to match off in the quarterfinals. In the round of 16, he had to play a guy by the name of David Carter from Australia, David Carter uh, from Davis Cup team. Wound up losing to David Carter. And Aaron and I uh, did not get to play, and I beat David Carter the next round. Wound up being a guy named Myra Martinez from um, um, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And um, top 20, top 50 type of guy. He was tough. And in the finals, I beat a guy by the name of Rick Fagel uh, from Miami. Real tough player. Uh, that was a back-to-back -back tournament that I won with the prize money. It was uh, Buddy Silver's uh, Invitational. Oh, yeah. Those were the prize money tournaments that they would put up ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars and pay you to play if you're one of the top players that win the tournaments because they need to attract the crowds. And um, I won all those tournaments, and all those tournaments basically fueled me to go to the Australian Open, the French Open, uh, the U.S. Open, and um, uh, uh, I also played Italian Open, Australian Open, and. Um, for a lot of black players, what was so tough was that they had to make money mm -hmm. in order to go play tournaments. And a lot of times while they're making money, they're teaching everyday players who can't play. They're not training. And uh, I got to the quarterfinals of Perth, Australia, mm -hmm. and won um, other Australian tournaments with the Australian Open and things like that. But um, um, a lot of things are not equally told with the challenges of what black players have had to do to be equal or even superior. And um, the history of black tennis has to be told because the challenges are not the same, still not the same. Right. That's 40 years ago I'm talking about. Let's imagine you got problems with Serena Venus and they're the players of today, right. the best players in the world. And if you don't think there's problems now, you can't even comprehend those problems of yesteryear. So it was a group of us that played. There were guys like Juan Farrell who beat John McEnroe four out of five times. That was my doubles partner that we played on tour together. I was fortunate to beat Juan several times. Uh, but there was one time that he did beat me that I regretted. And that was at MIT in Boston. I believe that was in 1973, it was televised with Bud Collins doing the commentary. Mm -hmm. It's the ATA Finals. 
They put it on TV, and this guy beat me 6-2, 6-0. <laughs> on TV. After the interview came on, Bud Collins interviewed both of us. I said, next year I'm going to come back. I'm going to beat this guy. I forgot I said that. <laughs> but I did come back next year, and I did beat Juan 6-4-7-5 in the finals. Okay. About four years later, I was at the U.S. Pro Championships in Boston, mm -hmm. Brookline, playing. And I just qualified. Won three matches and through qualifying. I came off of my last practice, and Bud Collins walked past me. And being that Bud is a pretty big guy, I don't know Bud Collins. When he walked past me, he came back, and he turned around and said, Maurice Hunter? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, Bud. <laughs> he's Bud Collins, you know what I mean? Got so, yeah, so I said, um, Bud, I said, I didn't think you would remember me. He said, remember you? He said, I'll never forget. Juan Farrell wiped the course with you, 6260, and you told me on TV that you would come back to beat him the next year, and he said you beat him. Seven five six four, and I said, "How did you remember that yeah, score, Bud? Yeah. Me?" Yeah. And he said, "I remembered it, and I wouldn't forget it." And that just tells you the impact of black players playing this game and what they mean. And until black people rep recognize black players and their accomplishments right. and share these things, it's not about any prejudice. It's about equal respect. And if you don't know my story, and I don't know your story, but I know all these other great stories, right. how am I going to even feel that you're worthy? Right. And you have the same commitment in the game. And I can name them. You had Marcel Freeman, one of the best players in the world, top 50. Some of these guys chase points. If you got the money, you can go get the points. I didn't always have the money. So I couldn't go get these points. I finished the top 300 or so. I would have finished in the top 20 if you added all those invitational tournaments that I beat all those ATP players and all those players that I beat in the qualifiers of those what they call the Grand Prix or the Grand Slam tournaments. Mm -hmm. Would have put me in the top 20. <laughs> and it would have been a lot different because you're making money every week and you're going tournament to tournament. And then you're also making friends, which basically primarily are Caucasian. But until you get the name and the reputation, they don't want to give you their place. They got the slots of the rankings. If they play with you and you have more talent, of course you're going to climb. And you're not part of the membership right. yet. Arthur Ashe was part of the membership. And I had conversations with Arthur Ashe. I had a conversation with Arthur Ashe at the French Open. In fact, that night, um, Zena Garrison, myself, Lori, not Lori McNeil, it was a um, um, young lady out of New York. I played doubles with her, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm getting a little old now. I turned 65. <laughs> right. Leslie Allen. Leslie Allen, name. yeah. So we played mixed doubles in the French that year. She got to the quarterfinals. I think she lost to Martina. Arthur Ashe was sitting with us at lunch and joined us and things. And um, he asked, can we go to dinner later? So we said we, we would, you know, it's fine. He said, well, I got a great place. I got a soul food restaurant. We said, in France? <laughs> Bob Ryland was with us also at the same time because okay. he was coaching Leslie. Uh -huh. And we said, soul food, that sounds good about now. So he told us to come meet him, at, gave us the address at this um, Chinese restaurant. So Bob and I were staying in the same hotel, and we kind of drove the, the, the subway together to the um, restaurant. And um, we got there. Arthur didn't get there. He was about 15 minutes late. Came in. We looked at the menu. We didn't see any soul food anywhere on the menu. Mm -hmm. So when Arthur came and sat down, we said, hey, uh, Arthur, where's the soul food? Mm -hmm. He said, don't you see it on the menu? We said, no, we didn't see it. He said, look, they got fried chicken. <laughs> now, that's a true story. That's a true story. So Bob and I looked at each other, and we love Arthur. And everything he represents. Yeah. But um, that's different people from different places and, and people who relate to all people. 
but I did have a conversation with Arthur at that time, and um, that's after he had his last bypass, mm -hmm. a quadruple bypass, and he was the, um, the Davis Cup captain. And we were both in the locker room, kind of together, because I played a match or practice, and they were preparing for a Davis Cup match, and you had Gene Mayer and some of the U.S. players in there, and they weren't really, after Arthur had stopped playing tennis, they weren't so nice to him. But boy, when he played, I knew Arthur when he played, and I was in those locker rooms, and they were really nice. After he wasn't able to take the court, they spoke with him a little more aggressively, a little more disrespectfully, a little bit broke my heart a little bit because he was a, always been an idol, always will be an idol, and a friend of mine. And later on, we wound up running e to each other. We sat down and talked, and he said, uh, he was feeling a little bad, and he said, Maurice, he said, can you do me a favor? And I said, yeah, well, thought, whatever. He said, um, can you um, tell me how do all the top guys feel about me? He was talking about the black guys. Like, um, we had guys like Rodney Harmon, mm -hmm. you had Juan Farrell, you had Horace Reed, you had Bruce Foxworth. And, I, you know, and I played them all and been with them all. And we would always see Arthur at the tournament. We were playing the qualifiers. He's straight in the main draw. So he said, now since he wasn't playing, he said, tell me, how, how does everybody view me? And what I represented mm -hmm. and I said well Arthur you know I know a lot but I said what does it matter it's all water on the bridge mm -hmm. you did the best you could because I know what he was going at and um, he said no but Murray's really um, he sent me letters before you know I was friends with Arthur you know too and um, he asked me well, just tell me <clears throat> and I said well I said Arthur I can't speak disparaging him about in, anything you did, because those are your decisions that you made. But I said, I'll give you an example. He, I said, when you played doubles, instead of picking up one of us, you picked up uh, Roscoe Tanner and played with him. Um, I said, Roscoe couldn't play. I said, that kind of tennis, it would have been great for us because not only would you have associated with us, but your compadres and friends they would have played with us we get practice and sparring right, with right, you because right. we're part of the group and they won't disrespect you because you's a baller right and he said well i wasn't much of a doubles player and then he anyway maurice and then i said well arthur that's all the more reason because mm -hmm. it wasn't going to cost you right. he said well i did play with yannick noah and i said well, wait a minute i said come on arthur you know yannick's a frenchman French Federation behind them. I said, that that don't count. Right. Um, so these are the kind of things that he talked about. And wrapping up, he just said, well, Maurice, I'm going to tell you, tennis has never been a thing that I feel that we need to do exclusively. I believe in education. There's a lot of other causes. It's only going to be so many good tennis players that's going to be playing, that's going to make it. I said, yeah, but Arthur, when you think about the magic that you got in that hand of yours, and when you hit that ball, I said, I've won many championships all over the country. And I said, kids peer through fences and they become very inspired just because I hit a ball. I said, I don't hit it quite like you. I said, when you hitting it and getting those results, I said, the inspiration that you can give to a child or a kid to take tennis it may not be him or her it might be their offspring but the feeling that they get from seeing somebody play the game and tell them that they're going to be special if they play that game I said it means everything Arthur it means everything and shortly thereafter you know we kind of wrapped up and um, I was glad that I got a chance to have that conversation with them because um, not long after that, you know, his health diminished more, mm -hmm. and it's, it's gone. And uh, we've had different conversations previous before that, that he grew up playing in the ATA, sort of like I did. Mm -hmm. Used to be in Wilberforce, Ohio, at Central State. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't playing tennis then, because I didn't start till 11. but. I'm from Detroit, so all the people in those black 
clubs. Motor City Tennis Club, that was part of Tri-City. Cleveland had Prairie Tennis Club, and I think um, Chicago had another one. And we would play what they call Tri-City, and then we would play different matches. Those, that was before um, it formed because blacks weren't allowed to play white tournaments. So these long-time clubs, black clubs, traditional clubs, were wonderful. And Arthur grew up with that concept, too, playing the ATA, because we all would go to the ATA. So before my time at Wilberforce, he met people like James Solomon, who they called Sal, and um, Jim Ray, and these names that I can go on. And every time I would see Arthur at the Doral, because that's where he used to be in Florida sometimes, and run into him on the tour, he always asked me, Maurice, how is that four-foot Sal doing? Because he's only four foot. He played in the... Uh, the baseball Negro Leagues years ago and he transferred over to tennis so these guys would try to you know play all the sports you know they were talented and Arthur would um, never forgot them mm -hmm. and uh, he used to ask me and it was so filling because he never forgot them he they I guess they watched him play through his junior right. years at the ATA and so uh, overall that Arthur Ash is a very special guy and one day uh, if it's possible, I certainly would like to do a story from what I know mm -hmm. and um, uh, what he really meant to a lot of black players. Enough for me not to share the hardcore truth of what some of the young black players felt because they didn't get the support uh, from him. And, um, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's not that easy mm -hmm. when you are a, a big star. I've seen Arthur play at Pauley Pavilion. Gave me some tickets. I came in and watched him play. Beat Raul Ramirez. Beat him to death. <laughs> Woof. I mean, he served him off the court. That dude could play some tennis that Arthur Ashe, I'm telling you. Right. I went back in the locker room afterwards, and so he was taking a shower and then cleaning up. And so um, he asked me, he said, um, so how's, you know, Juan? I haven't seen Juan. Farrell. Mm -hmm. And I said, Juan is trying. I said, we're all struggling. I said, you know, we can use that sparring and right. everything. And. You know, and um, his response was a little bit, you know, that would let me know that it's easy to forget sometimes, not all the time, where you come from. Right. And um, this guy is human like everybody. Right. And I think a story needs to be told not directly about his weaknesses, but his strengths and how his weaknesses should be avoided by other future black entities. Mm -hmm. For example, Serena Venus. And I have talked to Richard Williams, and he's an he's a outstanding man. In fact, um, he made uh, his daughters take a picture with me one time, and I was like, you know, I got too much admiration to tell him. He said, no more. He said, if it wasn't for you, it would be no Venus and Serena. You don't ask them to take a picture. You tell them what you want them to do. And I couldn't <laughs> tell them nothing. I wouldn't right. tell him nothing, right. but he did bring Venus over, and Venus kind of posed, and I got the picture. I put it up online on Facebook, and um, after they took the picture, he said, well, that's the only kind of picture you want? What do you really want? And I said, well, maybe, Venus, you can act like you know me a little bit, and she just, <laughs> oh, Richard is a powerful man, Okay. and his daughters love him, and all those championships, I, I don't know their, their mom. Right, okay. But um, I've had an opportunity sent with, sit with Richard uh, at the um, Carson tournament when it was mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. and he invited me to sit four or five days with him. We talked a lot right in the booth, and uh, we walked around the stadium. He used to ask me, Maurice, come on, let's walk around the stadium. We saw Pete Brown, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. And little do people know, um, I haven't saw the movie, incidentally, because, see, you don't really get to see all of Richard. Mm -hmm. And... When you see a part of Richard, you don't know Richard. Richard is an astounding man. Mm -hmm. And we walked around the place, and here's Pete sitting in a little crevice, right, okay. with his leg up. And um, so he said, hey, Maurice, let's go over and see Pete. And I said, you know Pete? I didn't know. Right, I don't, right. didn't know. And he said, oh, man, do we know Pete? He said, the girls love Pete so much that one time they heard he was sick. And we were down in Miami, he said. Mm -hmm. They said, can we uh, go see Uncle Pete? We hear he's sick. Both of those girls, so outside of not knowing them, I have a lot of respect for them as well. Mm -hmm. 
because they didn't forget where they came from. And they loved Pete. And he told me, they called him Uncle Pete. So when we got over to Pete, <laughs> Richard and Pete, you know, they were shooting it like they do. You know, they know each other so very well. And Richard loved, loved Pete so much. Mm -hmm. And I could see it in the camaraderie. And I knew Pete very, very, very well, too. And so it was just fun mm -hmm. for three guys to just see, even though the Richard and I connection wasn't there. I didn't know Richard, don't know Richard like that. Right. But to see Pete and know that I know Pete, right. he knows Pete. Right. The girls love Pete. You talk about a great feeling right? and a great yeah. man. I'm telling you, and Pete Brown as well I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Those are two incredible gentlemen. And um, I also want to do Pete, uh, do um, um, Richard Williams' story. Um, man is incredible. And some of the stories that he told me, you know, he doesn't have a bad bone in his body. I know no man is perfect. Right. But some of the stories that he told me in that time period that I sat with him, mm -hmm. from all the harassment, he never looked down on all those photographers or, or interviewers mm -hmm. trying to get a story. He actually told me, he said, you know, it was one guy though he said it was pesky he said i got three phones mm. he said let me give you these three numbers he said don't worry just keep calling you'll reach me right. he right. said but i got to change up because they always get my numbers and they bug me he said this one guy he said i couldn't get rid of him he said so he said this is his this is his sense of humor okay incredible sense of humor mm -hmm. He said, and the guy was a Caucasian pesky guy. Not that that's a problem, but that's what he was. And he said, well, the guy is always asking him questions about Compton. Like, you know, we, like everybody's shooting in Compton all day. It's, right. it's a place like every place. Right. It's like Beverly Hills. Right, right. It, it has its moments, but it certainly is not no different than any place else. Right. Well, he said, but this guy, he kept thinking Compton, Compton. I want to ask him about some negatives. Mm -hmm. So he said, what I did was, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. He said, I had a, a plastic phony like gun. Mm -hmm. He said, and I stuck it in my pants. So when he come up on me, I'm going to let it drop at the bottom of my pants. He said, I know <laughs> the guy's going to take off. <laughs> and he said, true enough, the guy walked up, Richard, Richard, Richard. And he said, and then he said he juggled his past gun. He said, oops, oh, I'm sorry. And he said the guy took off. He never had to deal with him again. That is hilarious. And now whether or not that's a true story, and right. I have reason to believe it is, because mm -hmm. Richard's humor and his love for people right. and his love and, and curiosity about making people feel good, mm -hmm. sharing his daughters, not a racial bone in this man's body. He wants to stay away from politics of right. in anything. All he wants is, is the best for himself and his family mm -hmm. and, and United States tennis. And I think that was something that has never been given to those right. girls and to Richard Williams. So uh, much love to Richard, his family, and I thank you. Uh, for filming this and giving me yeah. a chance to talk about it. Yeah, no, I was just getting ready to say we appreciate you taking time today to share, you know, your memories, your your personal accounts. Uh, this is history. This is not black tennis history. This is tennis history, right? And uh, and you are definitely a big part of it. So, folks, Mr. Hunter, right here, Brothers on Tennis. Uh, uh, don't forget, you can find me on www dot urban legends and superstars dot com check it out y'all thank you